Hi, everyone. Welcome to um, the first AT of our new year. Um, tonight, we're joined by Ashley Morgan Oliveira. Um, her uh, program tonight, as you probably saw on the calendar, is Stop the Spread, How You Can Identify and Manage Invasive Species with TexasInvasive.org and Alamo Area Master Naturalist. So Ashley is the Director of Research and Education for TexasInvasives.org, which moved to the Texas Invasive Species Institute, all these words, at Sam Houston State University in 2020. She received her MS in parasitology in 2011 before starting at TISI. She, uh, uh, I lost my six, <laughs> sorry. She started as an invasive species biologist. Throughout the past 12 years, she has worked extensively with federal, like USDA and APHIS. What's that? What's APHIS? APHIS. It's the invasive species segment. Okay. So it's animal plant <laughs> health. Okay. The state, TPWD and TDA, uh, and local HGAC groups in the M implementation of invasive insect, mollusk, and plant pathogen field surveys, along with participating clean river surveys in the Huntsville and Houston areas. She promotes the mission of Texas Invasive oh, lost it, Species Institute and TexasInvasives.org that focuses on public education, reporting, prevention, and management of invasive species by providing training and educational workshops to motivate others into action against invasive plants and pests. Welcome, Ashley. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so exciting. All right. I'm the first one of the year. This is going to be a very interesting talk. I hope that you get a lot out of it. And yes, I do have to mention that it did say I'm a parasitologist, so we are going to discuss a couple of creepy crawlies to be aware of. Uh, we'll be talking about prevention and management of a lot of different species. So let me go ahead and get started by sharing my screen. should go to the slideshow. So you can see my front slide. Yes, we can see it. Looks okay. great. All right. I'm going to go ahead and stop my video. And I do apologize if you hear in the background, I have a sick baby, but she's with dad right now. But just in case, I wanted to let you all know. So I am going to be talking to you today about San Antonio invasive species and how you can get involved with your master naturalist chapter, which I know some speakers should be touching more on that later. But as the introduction was, oh, nope. Don't do that. Mm -mm -mm. There we go. So as the introduction was saying, there's TexasInvasives.org, there's Texas Invasive Species Institute. It's a lot of the same words and the same things. And long story short, TISI, Texas Invasive Species Institute, and TexasInvasives.org, we were sister institutes where Texas Invasives focused a lot on public outreach and plant education. And us at TISI, we did a lot of field surveys fo focusing more on insect and pests. Now we have merged together. We are located over in Huntsville, Texas, to where we offer not only early detection and rapid response surveys for state and federal entities, but also we enhance public education for local groups such as yourselves, because really the ease the easiest way to fight invasive species is just to know that one, they exist and what you can do to stop contributing to their spread. This has all been made in part because of our partners like Texas Parks and Wildlife, a and AgriLife Extension, USDA APHIS, so the Invasive Species Branch of the USDA. So since we are still 
two separate or we're still two entities, but we are housed in one location. We still have two websites at the moment. Everything will be merging under TexasInvasives.org. But the point of this slide is that if you enter in Texas and Invasives, you will find us. You will find the same information. One database has more animals. One has more plants, again, given our original origins. However, everything will be merging soon. We've been working with the company for a couple of years. I've been waiting so long, but I'm getting off topic. The point is that we have illustrated descriptions. We talk about distribution and habitat, the biology and spread, ecological threats, native lookalikes. So you can always go to our invasive species databases to look into some of these species that I'm going to be talking to you about today. So I always start at the beginning. What is an invasive species? In 1999, President Bill Clinton, there was a federal decree that created a definition about what they called an invasive species. And that's a species that is non-native to an ecosystem under consideration whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. It's red, it's bolded because that is the most important part of the definition of an invasive species. You may hear an exotic species, you may hear the term weed, but how does that differ from an invasive species? An invasive species is, no, is known to cause harm. Harm can come in many different forms. It can impact your recreation, human health, industry such as lumber or um, zebra mussels that block up the hydro the water plants and all of that. So also it can impact our economy. That's a really big factor. It costs a lot of money to manage invasive species once they're here. It really can impact our agriculture, not only from soil nematodes, but there are crop beetles, there are crop pathogens that have come from other countries that we have to worry about. So there are a lot of different ways that invasive species can cause harm and they don't don't always cause harm in just one of those facets. And one of the perfect examples, the most infamous to me, <laughs> is the red imported fire ant. I am born and raised from Houston, Texas. I grew up with these. I thought these were native. No, no, no. They were hitchhikers in potted plants from South America. So the fire ant, it attacks native ground dwelling animals. It harms soil arthropod communities and it displaces native ants. So it has a large environmental impact. It has a huge economic impact because it can destroy numerous crops. So they will eat corn, soybean, blueberries, cabbage, and just to manage them, the cost and the impact that they cause on livestock, wildlife, the public health damages costs our state $500 million a year alone. This is one invasive species in one state. Yes, we are a ginormous state, but still. And it even has, it can threaten our health and animal health. If you are allergic to fire ants, it can cause anaphylactic shock. So this is one species that causes harm in many different ways. So we battle invasive species because this is a species that is entering into a new environment and it is causing problems. It's causing harm. Now, if it was able to stay in one place, we would be able to have a much bigger advantage in the battle against invasive species. But unfortunately, they also spread really quickly. They increase in population size. Sometimes it's because they produce more eggs. They produce more seeds. They have more generations per year. They're more cold tolerant. They're drought tolerant. They're just better at surviving. One of those examples is the red lionfish. This is a pet that is still commonly sold in aquaria and is caught is wreaking havoc throughout the Gulf of Mexico. So in 1895, oh, sorry. <laughs> in 1985, just two years before I was born, not, not that long ago. In 1985, there was a hurricane in Miami. Very common. It's Miami. 
However, there was a pair of lionfish that got out into the Atlantic Ocean. At that time, nobody thought anything. Okay, well, it got released to the wild, right? That was more the mindset. If you think about it, this is 14 years before there was a federal definition of what an invasive species is. So not everybody is even thinking about invasive species. So they go unwatched. And at first, there's a very slow pattern to their growth. But it's important to note that a lionfish has paralytic spines. So they have a venom that predators in these oceans have no idea what to deal with. And they have a voracious appetite. They will eat anything smaller than themselves. So they have no predators and they have an entirely new buffet open to them. Over the next years from 97 to 2022, you can see now that the lionfish has expanded from Philadelphia all the way down to Venezuela and South America. It's completely polluted the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic, as well as the Caribbean Sea. So with its voracious appetite, it's causing harm because it is eating the fish that manage our coral reefs. So this lionfish is causing harm in many different ways and it's spread. The way that it spreads, how quickly it can produce generations, that is causing harm in itself as well because it produces rapidly and we did a study at Tissy. We were looking for parasites in lionfish. Of course, the parasite, they had no parasites, which meant that they were doing better than native fish, but they also had fatty guts and livers. So the lionfish are doing so well in the Gulf of Mexico that they are getting gluttonous. They are fat. So that is one of the reasons why it's really important to be aware of how things are spreading and what you can do to contribute because sometimes it is a natural dispersal. I mean, once the lionfish were in the water, they disperse naturally, but you can't always explain expansion. And oftentimes the reason is human assistance. We are giving these invasive species a ride, whether we're doing it accidentally or purposefully. So accidental, if you think about it, ever since, you know, Marco Polo went to China and and did trade with the Khan dynasty, people have been trading goods for millennia, for centuries. So things have been moving back and forth. So there is a lot of accidental introduction. Produce, nursery stocks, ballast water is how zebra mussels got into our nat native lakes up in Michigan, and then they've traveled downwards. And then we've had a lot of purposeful introduction as well. The biggest introduction, purposeful introduction is ornamental planting. So landscaping, you've got to be very careful of what's in your yard. There were a lot of decades where, you know, even um, Textot was guilty of this, of plants were being brought in for erosion control because they were good at that, but we didn't know anything else about them. So there's also been decades of making up for our mistakes. And then also biological controls where we were introducing a predator thinking, oh, that'll cause, solve the problem. But then the predator gets a whole new ecosystem to ravage as well. So there's been a lot of ways that it, they have accidentally and purposefully been spread and they've been spread from any from all types of humans. So again, touching on the landscape industry, if you think about what are characteristics that are useful in the landscape plant, I must admit, I do not have a green thumb. So I would love a plant that is easy to propagate. It's easy to care for, and it has a lot of beauty and interest. So, you know, easy to propagate means there's a lot of seeds. The seeds last for a long time. The germination rate is high, easy to care for, hardy, no pests, diseases, beautiful. So they've got bright berries. Yeah, th those are characteristics of an invasive plant, right? If they produce more seeds than our natives. They're really hardy. They're impossible to remove once planted you will run into a lot of contradictions. So just because something is invasive does not mean it is not 
prohibited or it's prohibited to sell. So what that means is there are several species out there you that you will find on our websites. You will find them on all government websites saying that they're invasive, how problematic they are. However, it's up to different states and their different governing agencies to decide what is an invasive species. There are some federal lists that have been issued down, but just because a species is invasive does not always mean that it's prohibited to sell. So like I had mentioned, the red lionfish is still able to be sold. However, that does not mean that there are no species that cannot be, that, that are not allowed to be sold. There are. There is a noxious and invasive plant list. This is issued by the Texas Department of Agriculture. You can check this list and Texas invasives before you make your next landscaping purchase. If you go to a nursery and you notice, wait a minute, they're selling Chinese tallow and I know that that's on the noxious plant list, please send me an email. I will get in contact with the proper people at TDA. The nursery will be issued a warning Morning, if it's only their first time, but there are plants that are illegal to be sold and your help is great when you can let us know what nursery it is, because that's how we can stop the spread because these ones are actually prohibited. So let's at least stop those ones from being sold at any point in time. There is also a list of aquatic invasive and prohibited species that this is issued by Texas Parks and Wildlife. There are, it says here that permits may be issued allowing individuals to possess, sell, import, export, transport, or propagate listed species for zoological or research purposes or for aquaculture. I know that sounds like a lot of words, but what the point is that some of these things may be allowed to be sold with a permit. However, most of them are going to be prohibited that are on this list. So please, again, contact me with the name of the shop that is, they could be selling apple snails, giant salvinia, water hyacinth, things that they're definitely not supposed to be selling. You can always look at this list by entering TPWD, exotic species. If you just Google something like that, it will pop up to that link and it'll show you a prohibited list. So there are some species that are prohibited there, but however, us doing research and learning about the biology and doing port checks and looking and prohibiting species and providing some management, we are only half of the picture. The other half is engaged citizens like yourselves, those that are just aware now that they're able to have better habits and be more proactive in the fight against this. You really are the other half of this picture. So what you can do with texasinvasives.org. So there, as mentioned before, we have those invasive species databases. Those are identification resources. So we have our texasinvasives.org website and app, tsusinvasives.org website. And there is also the Quiet Invasion. This is offered by the Lower Galveston Bay Watershed and Upper Texas Coast. And I know I might have lost you as soon as I said Galveston Bay. However, definitely go to looking into this booklet, the digital. It covers a lot of species. A lot of invasive plants are throughout all the eco regions of Texas. So they do have a really good handout there as well that help. So how do you stop? Prevent dispersal, detect things early, be aware of how you're moving things, prevent tr transport. Don't move firewood, burn it where you buy it. Be sure to clean, drain, and dry your boat. Use native plants and animals in habitats and as pets. Help with detection. So in Texas, that's where we've created the Sentinel Pest Network. The Sentinel Pest Network is basically a list of the big, bad invasive species. So they may not be completely widespread throughout the state, like some of the plant species I'll talk to you later, but they are ones that are either here or they are very likely to appear here and we know that they can cause damage. And these are the ones on the Sentinel Pest Network that can be reported directly on our website. And I'll be introducing a couple of those species to you, as well as how to report those species using our website.
So the list of sentinel pests originally started as 12 and it's grown to 26. This is not a quiz. You do not need to rem remember this. Just please note that it is a wide variety of species. And currently in Texas, you will see quite a lot of them are currently in Texas. So it's really important. We do need your help tracking them. Just because they're in Texas does not mean that we want to take our eye off them. Because if we can be proactive, we really want to be. You can access this list going directly to our homepage. This is our homepage right here. If you go to TexasInvasives.org, Sentinel pests are right there. Does not require a login. If you wanted to look at a drop down list instead, you can go to the Take Action tab and click Report It, and it's right there. Again, does not require login, and we'll go more in depth later. Some of the sentinel pests that are on there, there are two invasive snails listed. One is the giant African land snail, and the other one is the apple snail. Today, we're going to talk more about the apple snail because this species is established in Texas. It is found in barren Guadalupe counties. It has been present there for a couple of decades now. <clears throat> and we do um, strongly suggest removal if you see them. But we also have the giant African land snail listed as a sentinel pest because this one can cause the same threat which will be parasites, and I'll touch on that in a second. However, this species is not here in Texas yet. It is consistently intercepted at airports because people think that giant snails are really cool pets. And I, if I was not a parasitologist, I would completely agree. They are very cool pets, but... There's a lot of extra stuff that comes with them, and these are also known to destroy the habitat. So the apple snail that is here in Texas, these are fully aquatic. So oftentimes the adults will be fully submerged under the water, so you may not see them. What you will be able to see will be bright pink eggs that are laid above the surface. So the apple snail on our reported page is Pomacea maculata. It's native to Brazil, Paraguay, and Argentina. It looks very similar to other Pomacea snails. Most Pomacea snails are prohibited on the Texas Parks and Wildlife list. This was introduced throughout the pet trade. It started with aquarium dumps in Texas. This map here by the USGS shows that in the Houston area, it is very well established. However, it has been present in Texas since 2000. And it has, there have been multiple sightings in the San Antonio area. It is found on the river walk. And one of the complications with removal is that the San Antonio River Authority has a say on what is done on their property, which is quote unquote, with their property is the river walk. So it can be hard to personally go and remove snails or their eggs. However, if your group wanted to maybe work with the San Antonio River Authority and tell them that you can offer free removal services for a couple of days, that could definitely pique their interest. But that's just something that you have to keep in mind when you're wanting to remove things off of public property is there may be some restrictions because they are freshwater snails. And the river walk, no, it is not deep. There are there are concerns with having citizens removing things all around public property when water is involved. So the bright pink eggs are what you're going to be able to see above the water lines. The way that their life cycle works is the adults are fully aquatic, so they are often submerged underwater. However, they come above the water line to lay eggs. Eggs will be found on concrete culverts, on trees, on plants. Anything that is above the water surface is where you can find these bright pink eggs. If you see these, that is the easiest way to confirm. Yes, you have apple snail infestation. There are no native snails that have eggs that look like this. And it will be a bright, anywhere from a bright pink bubble gum to when they get a little bit older and drier, it can be a little, a darker pink like this. However, 
<laughs> you won't be able to mistake, mistake it once you see it. So one of the parasites that this species and a slug that I'll bring up later is known to carry is rat lungworm. This snail has been documented to carry this invasive parasite in Florida, Hawaii, and Louisiana. So that is part of the concern with some of our invasive species is not just what they can do themselves, but sometimes it's what diseases, what parasites are they bringing with them? So these apple snails are able to bring parasites with them. So in nature, this angiostrongylus parasite is often, it interacts with a rat and a mollusk. That is how the, it lives its life cycle. It's called rat lungworm because it grows in the lungs of rats. So this, these are the animals that it needs to complete its life cycle. However, parasites are very, very aggressive and they will try to go into any mammal, not just a rat. So here in their life cycle, the rat has an adult female that lays eggs that grow into first stage larva. The larva are what's laid in their feces. The mollusk encounter the larva. They molt inside the mollusk. And so it could be an apple snail. It could be a garden slug. When it becomes the angry third stage larva, this is the stage that's infective to mammals. Again, the angiostrongylus is looking for a rat host. However, the larva is just looking for a mammal. The rat is how it completes its life cycle, but parasites are going to try to find anything. And the threat to us is when we accidentally intervene in this life cycle because we are a mammal. The larva are excreted in their slime trails. So if you think about a slug slime trail, that is how microscopic these larvae are. You cannot see them. However, if you wash your hands or if you do not come into contact with the slime trail there is no reason that you should come into contact with this parasite what do i mean by that so i had mentioned that we can accidentally intervene in this life cycle so angiostrongylus is just looking for a mammal angiostrongylus can be living in the mollusk right in the slug trying to find a rat it gets also excreted in the slime trail. So if you've had slugs climbing on your garden fruits and vegetables, if you undercook um, crustaceans that are infected with them, that is how we can accidentally come into contact. But what I'm is really important to know is that they have to be ingested. That means we have to eat the parasite in some form or fashion. The way that this parasite is traditionally spread throughout China is because they eat these mollusks raw or undercooked. We do not do that in the United States. However, this parasite is still here and it's able to spread because we accidentally come into contact. I know that right now you can't quite see, you can't see my face and you're probably like, oh my gosh, Ashley, what are you talking about? Is my garden not safe? Am I not? Safe? No, you are safe. It's just very important to know that these mollusks carry parasites that can be spread to them if we ingest them. They do not complete their life cycle in us. We are not a rat, thank goodness. So they are not trying to grow inside of us. They cannot. So it is not a permanent thing. However, it's not anything you want to encounter, and but it is preventable. It is COVID rules apply. One, please don't handle slugs, but if you have to, wash your hands before touching your mouth, right? If you are not getting that slime trail in your mouth, you'll be good. Watch your children in the yards when they're playing with slugs, but remove any slug or snail on your property or large snail. Small ones, that they're fine. They don't spread these, but wash any garden fruits and veggies, Honestly, a simple wash, it will remove any larva if they were to be present on these fruits or vegetables. You can do a veggie soak wash if you want, but just any washing and remove any mollusks. So this is preventable and that is how we're getting started. That is your one of your first species of the day is the apple snail. Now, I know that you might be thinking, Ashley, you just said it can give us parasites, but you want us to go manage them. Again, it's a matter of Wash your hands. So if you are able to set up a removal day, wear gloves when you're doing the removal and be sure to wash your hands before eating or wash your hands before touching your mouth. If you just hold a slug, no, you cannot get infected. 
But just remember, if you are encountering these things, you're removing them off your property, please wash your hands before touching your mouth. If you see the eggs, squish them. We do have educational pamphlets or signs that we can send if you want them to be installed in areas near you where it gives the outline of basically smush the eggs if you see them. We do not want them to turn into adults. So in, in one of our next sentinel pests, this is a species that is not here yet in Texas. It's called the spotted lantern fly. And it's a very unique looking insect. Here you can see it's got spotted four wings and the back wings almost look like a watermelon with an eye spot back here. So it is native to Mexico, but it was imported on goods from Asia, which may sound confusing, but that is just how some of these species spread. So ironically, it did not get to the United States through Mexico. It came in through goods from Asia and it is found in Pennsylvania. And as of 2022, this is how widespread the insect has gotten. It's able to fly significant distances and it's known to live off of 70 host plants. One of the commercial plants that we're most concerned about in the state of Texas is the common grapevine because we have such a long or a widespread wine production industry in the state. We do not want this insect to be introduced because not only does it affect grapes, it can affect many, many other host plants. Now, while we may not have a lot of commercial plants that are available throughout the state, we do have one of the host plants throughout Texas, and that is the invasive tree of heaven. So this is one of those ornamental plants that can still be sold. It is now, it's found in 47 counties in Texas. So basically what this means is not only do we have the grapevines to attract this spotted lanternfly, we also have one of its favorite host plants from this from Asia. So it's able to set up quite well. And the reason the tree of heaven is also considered an invasive species is it is able to overtake sites. It forms impenetrable thickets. It produces toxins to prevent growth of native plant species. The Chinese tallow also does that, those allelopathic effects where it makes it hospitable for itself. So it creates monocultures. When you create monocultures, that change what that changes what types of insects are rodents, reptiles, birds are in your area. So this one poses a lot of different types of harm, but you might also notice that this species has been in the United States for quite a long time. What is that, 240 years about? So we're a little bit behind the ball. However, if you do have this species present in your yard, please remove it. And even if it's for sale, you know, that just because it's for sale doesn't mean it's not invasive. It is a very unique looking plant because it has large compound leaves. It flowers in late spring and it has samaras. So kind of those papery seeds that you'll see on ash trees. It has those samara seeds, but they're a really pretty pink and orange, which is partly why they were imported because they have very pretty seeds. However, one tree can produce up to 300,000 seeds and and the tree can grow up to 80 feet tall. So they can really take over a, a site. So back to the spotted lantern fly. This is a very unique insect. It, it grows up to one inch long. That is very big when you think about insects that aren't cockroaches, right? So one inch long, it is bright. It is spotted. There is absolutely nothing like it in the United States that looks like this insect. So if you see something that is one inch long, has this black netting on the back and black and spots on white wings, please report it to us. The instars are also black and spotted. So the early ones will only have white spots while the late immatures will have white and red spots growing on them as well, kind of making them look like those watermelon patterned back wings. Another insect that's on our sentinel pest network is the cactus moth. So this is a snout moth and the adult is a very generic looking moth. 
However, the larva is not generic looking. It is a bright orange caterpillar with black stripes and it is native to Argentina. It This is one of those biocontrols gone wrong. It was introduced to the, to the Caribbean islands because they had a problem with prickly pear cacti, which while they're native to Texas and southwestern United States, it is not native to the Caribbean. So they thought, let us bring in these cactus moth, that'll solve the problem. Well, it somewhat solved the problem, but it also allowed the cactus moth to hop over from the Caribbean to the Florida Keys and then the Keys into mainland Florida. And now it's made its way throughout the southeastern United States. And it has been present in Texas for now. If we are in 2023, it has now been present in Texas for five years. It has been found in Brazoria, Calhoun, Chambers, Colorado, Matagorda, Jackson, and Hayes County. Counties. And while some of those are a little east of you, there's plenty of opportunia species, which is its host species in the area. And so we, this is one that we definitely want to keep an eye out on this, not only to protect our native cacti species, but also to protect others, um, other industries, because we don't know how what kind of impacts this could have on the agave industry, even though it's a different type of cactus, who knows if these cactus moth will change their appetites. So one way to identify them is the egg sticks. They are going to be laid at the spines. So right off of the cacti pads. So you might notice where, oh, this this area looks a little wilted and then you get closer and it'll you'll notice it's a bunch of little eggs laid together. So they'll lay 60 to 100 eggs per stick. The eggs will remain there for two to three weeks. Then they will turn into caterpillars that are orange with black spots. These spots will eventually merge together to form bands. We do not have Halloween striped caterpillars. So if you see something of this coloration, please send me a picture. Adults, it, it's just going to be too hard to identify without a microscope and dissection. So you would have to mail in a specimen. A picture of an adult won't necessarily help. But it's important to note that this time of year, even though every the temperature is kind of more mild right now, it's not quite as cold. When it gets colder temperatures, the cactus moth will migrate down lower into the cactus. So they may not be as apparent as shown here in these photos. They may be more towards the root of the cacti itself but they could be present at this time so symptoms or signs of infestation is oozing at wounds and spines desiccation and hollowing with obvious caterpillars inside however it's important to note with the oozing and the desiccation like these this could be caused by a plant pathogen or some other animal injury so really it has to be kind of more the sweet of you know are you having these symptoms as well as is there an orange and black striped caterpillar on your plant but please contact us about the cactus moth so I wanted to take a moment real quick and see if there were any questions to address before I continue on with a few more species. All right. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, we do have uh, one question here about apple snails. Uh, they wanted to know if they've ever been found in the Colorado River. You know, I'd have to look at the water, the river systems again, that's a really good question because it's present in 10 watersheds. And I'm trying to imagine where the Colorado River is and it runs all the way around in between, but it's not as, I think it's more in the Houston area. It hasn't gotten to the Colorado River because it can run, it runs, it drains into the Gulf around that area south of Houston. It might be. That's a really good question. Okay. I'm going to look that up. Awesome. Um, we do have some comments um, about apple snails. So Emily Hawthorne said that our group does indeed remove them and their egg cases. And one of our members received an award from the San Antonio River Authority recently for removing over 2,000 apple snails. So, Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I love okay. that so much. Oh, that's fantastic. Fantastic. Actually, um, 
if you don't mind, my my email will come up at the end, but if you could send information about that, we would love to highlight that person. And we have a monthly eyewire where we talk about invasive species and engaged citizens. And so if your chapter ever does anything like that, please send us that information. We love to highlight people that are really engaged because I, all right. oh, I love that too. Yeah, I'd be happy to. That's fantastic. <laughs> And I love that y'all are getting together with the San Antonio River Authority because I, I knew that I would advise many people that would reach out because that's, you have to work with them to. Absolutely. They're a partner of ours. We do a lot of different volunteer efforts wow. with them. So um, let's see, we've got one more question that just came in. Uh, what happens if a human is infected with rat lungworm? Great question. So the worms are confused in us. We don't have the same chemical cues. So instead of going into our lungs like they would in a rat, they actually will go into our brain. And, um, and let me turn on, I feel like, let me turn on my camera right now. <laughs> so, so they'll go into, they'll go into our brain looking for the right place to where they can molt and lay eggs like they would in the rat. Uh, however, they will die in there. So it can cause some, it can cause some swelling and it can cause some scarring, but they will die. We are not the definitive host but it's just not anything that you want to experience. Um, and there is a different species of angiostrongylus that's here in Texas as well. And that one, those worms will go into our gut and they'll cause um, stomach issues. But it's really important to know that the worms die in us. They, they will not reproduce, but it's not anything that you want. I mean, nobody wants worms inside them. So it's just, that's why we do this. Um, we always make sure to point out this preventative. All right. Sounds good. That is all we have for questions right now. Uh, we'll keep an eye on them for the end of the presentation. All right. Thank you. So now we'll go into some other invasive plants and pests. So these are ones that are not technically sentinel pests that you can report right off of our website, but these are ones that you can find out more information on our databases. And as it's mentioned here, these are going to be ones that you will commonly encounter. So we do strongly encourage removal. One of these is the China berry tree. So this is one of those other infamous invasive plants that was brought here as an ornamental in the mid 1800s. So it has been a popular shade tree in Southern states for over 200 years. It loves riparian and disturbed areas, but it's very hardy. So that means it is not picky. It is well established throughout the state, much like the tree of heaven. This is a common theme that you'll notice in a lot of invasive trees trees. It creates monocultures because it has a lelopathic effects. So it changes the soil composition to benefit itself. This is something really important to know about China berry. It serves no pollinator benefit. No pollinator benefit. You may see that pollinators do like a Chinese tallow tree. However, there's like a hundred native species that a bee and butterflies would easily go to as well. But it's really important to know China berry, no pollinator benefit. It is also resistant to native insects and pathogens. So biocontrols have not been an option with trying to remove this species. And again, another important thing to note is that all parts of the plant, especially the fruit, are poisonous to humans, some livestock, and mammals like cats and dogs. So this tree serves no benefit except for someone thought that it was really pretty hundreds of years ago. So it is a deciduous tree that grows to 50 feet in height to each in diameter. The leaves are alternate bipinnately compound. They will grow one to two feet in length. They turn a golden yellow in the fall. So, oh, yay, foliage. Um, they have flowers that are quite, quite unique. So it starts with um, a cluster of lavender buds, and then it'll become a five-petaled flower. The fruit, this is what you'll really notice when you're driving around. You'll see these hundreds of hard yellow marble-sized stalked berries. And then the bark has 
red bark with grayish vertical lines, but this suite of traits is really what will help you identify a china berry. They, one tree can have thousands of berries on them. Another species that you will find, and this one caught a lot of traction a couple of years ago, is the hammerhead flatworm. This has been known to be in your area for about 20 years at this point, so it is not unexpected for you to have it here. However, you can always email us a sighting. And because of engaged citizens like yourselves, we've been able to get a really good understanding of how widespread this species is. But as the common name mentions, it is a hammerhead flatworm. So it is a flatworm with a hammerhead shape. Being a flatworm, that means that it can squeeze into the weirdest places. So you may find it in the shower. You may find it in the potted plant that you just brought home. You may find it stuck to your dog's leg. It can be found anywhere. People will get nervous because oftentimes you'll read hammerhead flatworm and neurotoxin and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. It does secrete a neurotoxin, but it secretes a neurotoxin so that it can eat earthworms. So, so it's a neurotoxin that affects earthworms, not vertebrates like ourselves. You may get an allergic reaction if you hold this, but I can honestly say of the thousands of reports that I have received, I think I've known two people that actually had an allergic reaction and it was something that could be managed with calamine and some steroid cream, right? So if anything, it might cause like a, just a skin rash, but Honestly, it does not cause any issues. If your animal eats it, they will instantly throw it up because that is the flatworm's defense mechanism. Your animal, your cat or dog may not feel great, but it will not harm them. I can confirm that as well. I've known several people to that their animal ingested it and then regurgitated it afterwards. So this is something that you will find. It's really important to remove it from your yard because it is a predator of earthworms, which are necessary for our compost piles or our garden settings. So please remove these. And it's important to not chop them up into pieces because they will regenerate from segments. So speaking of earthworms, there is the Asian jumping worm. This species has been starting to appear in Texas. And it has other names like snake worm, crazy worm, Alabama jumper. The reason it's called a jumping worm is if you've ever angered a garter snake, you know, when you're, you're out and maybe you've disturbed a little snake and it thrashes around and it's really, really upset. That is how this jumping worm reacts. It's not all slimy and floppy and curl. It doesn't curl up like a normal earthworm does. So a lot of the way you're going to identify a jumping worm has to do with its behavior and it does have morphological differences. So there's over 400 species worldwide. So we're just going to stick with Amanthus spa. So Amanthus species, they've hitchhiked in potted plants. Like many of these species, it's all accidental. They were first found in the night Northeast in the 1910s, and now they're invading southwards. They're found in 20 states, and they are worse than European earthworms. It's really important to remember, no earthworms are native to the United States. They were all introduced with the colonists. The, the European earthworms were brought over with the colonists and our garden areas have a, and agricultural areas have adapted to have those earthworms. However, regardless of if it's an Asian jumping worm or a normal garden compost worm, do not introduce it into your forested or native habitats outside of your garden area. So why is the jumping worm worse? It will consume all organic matter. There is no, there is no composting. There is no nutrient cycling with a jumping worm. They will completely remove all nutrients, degrade the topsoil. They completely change the composition of the soil. And they also are able to mature twice as quickly as European earthworms. So they consume the organic layers of topsoil and they create this coffee ground appearance. It can't hold moisture anymore. It causes erosion. It loosens the top layer of soil so much the plant roots have a hard time hanging on. So look for this coffee ground soil in your area to kind of illustrate how they can cause harm is 
the forests have a certain layer of herbaceous vegetation they've got duff layer they have various layers of soil but once jumping worms and even our european earthworms once they get introduced into a forested area they can remove the entire layer of soil and vegetation that was necessary and protecting the trees and providing nutrients for them as well so this is a perfect before and after of before jumping worms reached a forested area and afterwards. So telling the difference. I, I mentioned how, yes, the Asian jumping worm will thrash and jump around. Here's a really good close up. So this collared area on earthworms in general is called a clitellum. On the Asian jumping worm, the clitellum is white and flush, so it is even with the body. Also, you might notice this worm pictured here as well, it almost looks as if it's dry and smooth, and that's because it is. They are not slimy like our normal or European earthworms. They are not floppy. If anything, they might be a little more rigid than what you're used to. So really, those characteristics combine, combined, because our European earthworm, yes, it has a clitellum, but it's pink, so it's almost more the color of the worm, and it's raised. And it will undulate and wiggle like what you expect. So that's how you'll be able to tell the difference between these species. And the final species that I'll introduce to y'all today, this is, again, this is one that you will a thousand percent encounter. Bear County is one of those uh, ground zero areas. Not exactly, but we... We knew it to be present in Bear County, but when it popped up in Orange County and we had no other data in between in Orange County is that last county before Louisiana, we thought at our institute, we need to look into this more. And thanks to engaged citizens, we've been able to fill in all of these counties. All of this information is from reports from citizens. But please note, yes, we do know it is in Bear County. It is important to remove this slug as well. It can carry the parasites. So if you see a black slug, remove it immediately. You can go to our website for many management strategies, we do not have a native slug that is black. So if it is black and it it's called velvet leather leaf because velvet, it's, it's almost matte. It has a velvety appearance. It's not slimy. But if you see a black slug in your yard, it is invasive and please remove it. And remember, the parasite is prevents, pre preventable. Just wash your hands before touching your mouth. Do not keep slugs or snails as pets. Please do not. And wash garden fruits and veggies. Really important things for prevention, especially for a lot of these invertebrates that can get in your yard. So the flatworms, the slugs, the, the jumping worms. Look out for hitchhikers in your soil, plants, mulch, or compost. Oftentimes, a lot of people will say, oh, my neighbor brought new plants or, oh, we just brought in a new tree or is that that's oftentimes how a lot of these critters accidentally spread around. Please, if you do fishing, just be aware of what kind of worms you're buying for bait and always throw them away in a trash can. Don't dump them in the water because they can swim and don't dump them in the forest or, or in a native area because remember, no earthworms are native to Texas. Think about what kind of compost or mulch you're using, making sure that it's really well heated so it kills any of the pathogens, pathogens being um, jumping warm eggs and things like that. Or you can even do the sunning method, especially in your area where you use the transparent plastic sheet, but it's not ideal if your soil is sandy. It'll retain moisture, so it might take too long to actually heat it up properly and dry it out managing invasive plants. I touched on this a little bit. Really, a lot of it comes down to you'll have to use an integrated strategy. It it You'll have to treat early and you'll have to remove often. Just choose a technique that you think works best for you. You can always go to our websites. We do discuss management options for different, for all the species on our page. So sometimes you may need to do mechanical and chemical. Chemical is where you cut and treat or you do a basal spray or a stem injection. It's just, it's really important to remember with chemical, you know, you don't want to overspray 
make sure that you're reading the instructions. Does it require a license to use it? So just really being focused on your efforts. One of my favorite things to do is cut and treat where you cut the tree and then you literally paint the herbicide onto the tree stump immediately after it's cut. It focuses all of the herbicide into the stump without spraying onto other plants around it. And you'll have to monitor. I mean, think about the China berry and um, the tree of heaven. I mean, thousands of seeds that can last for years. So you'll have to monitor seed bank and just keep planting natives. Because if you remove something from the area, you need to replace it. And it's just really sticking to it. So those are invasive species. Now we can talk about how you can report them. I touched on this earlier. So our monthly eyewire, as I mentioned, that is it, it. It's a monthly eyewire. It talks about invasive species, and we love to highlight citizen groups that are getting engaged throughout the state to let others know that it, one, it, it our newsletter reaches thousands of people. So sometimes they may be able to find out about your work group when they may not, you know, they may not be a master naturalist, but they still really want to help out. And then maybe they get involved with helping out and they become a master naturalist. So it's just a way to really get that out there. And also we highlight a lot about invasive species research happening in the state, in the country, anything that's new. If you sign up for this, that is all you will get from us is a monthly eyewire. So reporting, remember those sentinel pests, they can be found on our homepage. It does not require a login. You can just click the arrows left or right to select one of the 26 species, or you can go to take action and click report it does not require a login. Once you click on the species that you want to report, this form will show up. It is important for you to fill this out, especially your email and your the latitude, longitude, and a picture. Those are the most important things because I need to have a way to contact you if what you're reporting is something new, is exactly the invasive species you're reporting. I need to have a way to confirm that. But again, all we ask for is your name, email, phone number, address, and then the location of where it's collected. If you're not comfortable filling out your address, please fill out email and location information. Since we can only right now, we only allow one photo. Again, with the new website, new things will happen. One photo, it has to be two megabytes. So just please make sure it's something in focus. It's nice and proportional. And so I have a clear idea of what you're trying to show us. So if you're trying to report a cactus moth, remember, try to get a picture of the caterpillar, not necessarily the moth. Go with something that's easier to identify. We do have a Texas Invasives phone app. If you're iPhone, it's Texas Invaders. If you're Android, it's Texas Invasives. And this was developed by Bugwood or the Center for Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health over in Georgia. They're amazing over there. And if you want to learn how to report about more species, you can always sign up to become a citizen scientist right on our homepage. You click the citizen scientist tab, you click become a scientist. Voyager online training program is how you can do the program by yourself if you want to do that. And that's how you can report other plants. But if you just need to report a species, please, please, you can always email us at our shared inbox invasives at shsu.edu. But please include a photo and location information just in case we're not able to reply to you right away. That way we have all the information in one email. The final thing that I was talking about earlier as well is that not all plants and pets that are sold are prohibited for sale. So if you're interested, please contact me at invasives at shsu.edu if you would like to. If you go into a aquarium stores often and you don't mind looking at a list of species and seeing if they are selling these species mind you some of these are prohibited to sell some of these are just invasive invasive does not mean prohibited if you are willing to go into an aquarium store and you want to report to us about species that they are selling we are doing a marketability survey we just want to know and also we like to keep track because sometimes there is an accidental 
international spread of invasive species as well. So with that, I'll just leave a few of the contact information up here. You can always go to our website for invasive species and management. You can report sentinel pests at texasinvasives.org or our app. And you can email other invasives at a, an aquarium watch reports to invasives at SHSU. And I will actually put my personal email in the chat as well. If you ever, you know, I always like to say anything invasive or just weird, you know, uh, I am a parasitologist, so I'm, <laughs> I'm usually pretty open to what you want to contact me about. So thank y'all so much for having me. If we have any more questions, I hope we have time for them. I think we do have just a few more questions. Um, so Kristen asks, can you talk a little bit about invasive species that are now accepted as part of our environment, like dandelions, starlings, cattle egrets? Specifically, she's wondering if there are species right now that are approaching the point where they will be accepted as part of our environment and beyond the point of feasible invasive management strategies. You know, I was asked a question, at the similar, a similar question at the end of last year, and it really had me thinking that I wonder who's studying this right now, because we are, we have reached that with some of these species, especially like the ones that she mentioned, like starlings were brought over hundreds of years ago to where, you know, do we just accept it at this point? But there is still a lot of research into where, yes, you know, these wetlands may have been inhabited by these invasive plants for so long, but they're still doing restoration and you see the change in habitat where it's like it's still worth the effort. But some of these more mobile species like birds or axis deer or things like it, it can be where I wonder that myself sometimes, too, it's like, when will it just. And it, it has to vary for each animal or plant, I imagine, how long it's here mm -hmm. to where it becomes naturalized. But I think a lot of these species are getting close to being naturalized, especially a lot of the plants. But it's like just because they are doesn't mm -hmm. mean, you know, plant them in your yard or share them with your friends, you know, try to keep actual native plants. And on a related note, does your organization, does Texas Invasives, do anything in terms of working to remove some of the invasives that are currently in um, natural areas, or are you, are you focused primarily on trying to uh, educate folks so they, they don't um, purchase them at the nursery, kind of prevent them from entering into the natural areas to begin with? It's kind of both. Like if we can facilitate a work day, you know, where we're not a huge workforce at, at Texas Invasive. So we don't kind of necessarily have the manpower, but we've been doing a lot of facilitating to get groups, you know, where it could be an interested chapter and just connecting them. Like how y'all were able to connect with San Antonio River Authority. We try to do that with other groups as well to where maybe we're the ones contacting AgriLife or contacting Parks and Wildlife to say, hey, this group group wants to do this but we're working on trying to get like herbicide application licenses so we can help a lot more with that and get some funding to do removal in, in natural areas but really we've been doing a lot more training for these work groups so whenever new members come in we provide the training and then they can go and do the removal for different groups got it okay yeah. A um, couple more questions. Are there native earthworms that can help the composition process and improve the earth? So there are no native earthworms to the United States. Um, so I'm not quite. So what was important in that is earthworms are OK in your fields. They're OK in your gardens. But that's where they should stay. If we start moving them into our other habitats um even these your even so european earthworm and the european honeybee are perfect examples of naturalized animals where if you think about it they don't cause more harm than good right so they wouldn't be characterized as invasive if they don't cause as much harm but if they continually cause harm even if they're naturalizing so um the European earthworm will still change the composition and it'll still have a negative impact on our forested areas, but it is very beneficial for agricultural and garden areas. It's just about kind of keeping, 
keeping each worm in its lane. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, that makes sense. Um, and then the last question is, what is the status of the emerald ash wood borer here in Texas? Oh, great question. So yeah, for sake of time, I didn't touch on the EAB, the emerald ash borer. It is still primarily localized up in North Texas. So it was first found in the Texarkana area. But um, I'd say about three years ago was when it was confirmed. No, what year are we in? Sorry, time flies. Five years ago, it was found in Tarrant County, Fort Worth. And um, at the end of 2021, it was confirmed to officially spread into Dallas County. So it is present from Texarkana in a about five counties in Texas right now. But, you know, the I-35 corridor, there's, you know, it can easily spread. So the emerald ash borer is something to definitely always look out for. If you have ash trees on your property, you can always go to our website for identification resources as well. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much, Ashley. I'm going to turn it over to Jeanette. She says that we have a couple announcements uh, here before we finish up for the night. Thank you, Thank you Ashley. Ashley.